Hey everybody, my name's Alex. I wanna welcome you guys back to another week's devlog. Now, I've had a crazy past few weeks here. I've done all kinds of new things. New levels, new powers, new animations, all sorts of good stuff. Can't wait to show you guys, so let's just jump right into it. here, I wanted to go over something more basic I did. You'll notice last week, Emily's fighter was tending to drift left as she ran, and two weeks back, you'll notice that the fighter just took off from the ground, despite flying not being on his list of approved powers. This is all due to the fact that we had to implement a new way for our characters to move. Now that the terrain is raised above the lane, we were running into some issues with the player clipping through walls, which obviously is not what we intended. So, we switched to something built into Unity called the Character Controller, which gave us access to an advanced movement function to prevent these issues. It did take some time to work out the kinks, as you clearly saw, but after messing around with it, we finally and once again have the gift of movement. In addition to that, that also meant I had to make some other changes, such as fixing the fighter's charge, the wizard's teleport room, and a new thing I put in, a mechanic for the player to be feared by one of our enemies. Hint hint, is the giant T-Rex. This week, I also wrapped up the animations for all the pirates and the time lost. The most notable this week was the chieftain. He had a basic run loop like all the other humanoids, but I also had to deal with the ancestors he comes with. If the player hits these, the chieftain takes more damage than normal. So, I had to animate them in a way that made them feel like floating spirits, but also in a way that caught the player's eye so they know to hit it, but also couldn't make them too fast or the player would never be able to hit them. However, I think I balanced it well and they came out just right. It should be a cool mechanic for the player to work around as they battle the time lost. This week, we all collaborated pretty hard to do the actual number balancing for the game. We had a lot of factors to work with, from towers to enemies to the heroes. At first, we weren't exactly sure where to start, but we stumbled across a great system and I highly recommend it to all game devs out there trying to figure this out for themselves. The numbers themselves just don't really matter at first. Just pick a section of your game and balance it relative to other members of the same section. For instance, we began by setting some baseline health, speed, and numbers for the powers for our enemies. We wanted to get a sense of enemy power compared to each other. For instance, how much faster is a scout than a swordsman? A swordsman and a buccaneer fill the same niche, what's the power difference between them? How much stronger should a sorcerer be than the swordsman? And with that train of thought, we were able to get some great baseline numbers down. Then we moved on to the towers and balanced those guys against each other. Once we had those done, we went in and tested it out on our base sample level, and realized that our towers were a bit too strong for enemies and that enemies were a bit too fast. So, keeping that relative scale in mind, it was very easy to shift around the numbers so they kept the same relative strength between each other but gave us the desired gameplay. So, long or the short, balance things relative to the components of the same type and then worry about integrating it with a balance of other things in the game. It gives you a great place to start and helps you get the correct feel for each element of the game that you're looking for. Another quality of life improvement I made was condensing some of the numbers you see when damaging an enemy. If you saw my last devlog, you'll remember that beam attacks created this ugly conglomerate of text that was just unreadable and frankly not that helpful. So to remedy this, I classified damage that the enemy takes as stored or non-stored. Non-stored damage simply spawns the text you see and carries on. Stored damage applies it to the enemy's health but doesn't display the text right away. Instead, it banks the number in a list. Every second, I add up the values in the list and display that number instead, clearing the list for more to be added. This way, beam type attacks don't clog up the screen and give you some meaningful numbers to work with. I also implemented two new powers for our heroes. 
We all decided that the General's beam power and the Ace's beam power were uninspired and just not that fun to use, especially since you can't use them along with their respective shoot powers. So, for the Ace, we replaced his beam with a pistol whip. This is a fairly simple melee attack that damages and stuns enemies in front of you. This works well with his towers and airstrike power, as he's all about making sure the enemies get caught in the path of his various aircraft, so pinning down an enemy for a few seconds could mean all the difference. I was especially happy with the way the animation turned out for it. Run that back again, in slow motion. For the general, we gave him a fairly unique power. He can drop a landmine that persists for a few waves. If an enemy gets close, it will explode in an area after a short delay. This could be used as a safety net if you want to spend some time setting it up near the end of the level, or you could slap them down near the front if you want some quick DPS. Put on your war faces, gentlemen. Now, let's go and make the greatest war movie ever! Yeah! 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 Right. yeah. Oh. All told, we think these new powers are much more engaging for the player and should make those characters a whole lot more fun to play. I also made some small changes to the player's aiming reticle. Before, the raid cast would pick up anything it hits, which could include the player making your attacks fly off erratically sometimes. So, I made it so that the Raycast would only hit the proper layer, that being the layer of the enemies. It took a bit of time to make sure the enemies were actually in the layer and the Raycast was hitting things properly, but finally things actually point the way they're supposed to. I did a bunch of other smaller things this week. These include, but are not limited to, reworking the engineer beam to work with a Raycast instead of a normal projectile, Enemy animation speed being changed when they get slowed. and fixing some bugs including a cooldown visual thing that would happen. Another thing I did was redo how the fighters strike and shield slam work. Mechanically, they're the exact same, however, under the hood, they now act a little bit differently. In the past, they had just been a short lifespan, fast-moving projectile. However, this implementation caused all sorts of problems, as sometimes the projectile was simply too fast and it didn't pick up collisions, it was hitting walls and things that it weren't supposed to for some reason, and just all kinds of problems. There was a thorn in my side, so I finally said, enough is enough, and now it is done through the code. So basically what happens is, it picks up the targets that you could possibly hit that are both in front of you and close enough distance. And then for the strike, it damages the closest one, while for the shield slam, it just damages and stuns all enemies that it picks up in that distance and angle. So this way, the fighter's attacks are much more reliable and they actually act the way I want them to. Well, 
that's all I got for you guys this time. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, we would really appreciate it if you could go over to Steam and wishlist our game. It really helps us out. And if you guys want to stay up to date on these devlogs, just be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. Next week, Nick's going to go over all the stuff he's been doing. You're not going to want to miss it. So, in the meantime, game on.